Oh my goodness. I gotta go through that again. I'm sorry, my microphone was turned off. I must have turned it off last night. All right, so thank you for coming to our channel. My name is James, and I am here to talk about the struggles with growing with video and some of the struggles that we've gone through over the last year with our YouTube channel and what you can do to avoid those struggles and how you can improve your chances of growth in the coming year. And as we finish this year and move into next year, there's a lot of opportunities right now that we didn't have six months ago, that we didn't have a year ago. And there's some things that are really, really starting to take off that are going to help you grow your channel. So thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Adrian. She joined us on our other live stream last night. You are doing a great job. You are blowing it up. R1J1, hello, Jenny. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for joining us today. And if you're new here, if you're coming in, please say hello in the chat if you're coming into the live stream. And if you're coming in on the replay, leave us a comment and say hello. Let us know how you're doing. So one of the things that we've been talking about, and I'm going to be doing some questions and answers with the chat here in just a little bit. So if you have questions about what we're talking about, please hold on to them. I will be getting to them here in just a little bit. Um, but one of the biggest things that we've been working on is helping people to be successful with their YouTube growth. And the number one thing i've got some strategic things that we're going to talk about and some some tactical things that we're going to talk about in youtube that are working right now but before we get into those the one of the number one keys to being successful in youtube i'm jules oh i'm sorry hi jules so one of the number one keys to being successful with your YouTube channel is uh, your mind. What's going on in here? How you think about YouTube is one of the biggest keys to being successful or not. And for example, just two days ago, I saw a huge difference in the mindsets of different people. If those of y'all that were on YouTube two nights ago know that YouTube went down for like an hour and a half. And some people just kept doing what they do. And they were like, okay, well, let's go work on something else. Let's do some production work. Let's work on some scripting. Let's do some things behind the scenes to continue working on our channel. And other people blew up in the groups. I'm in, a, I don't know, a dozen Facebook groups, groups on Twitter. Everywhere I was going, people were panicking because YouTube went down. Something, they did an update or something and crashed a server and the whole platform got messed up for like an hour and a half. And people were like panicking. And this gives you a huge clue into the mindset of people. And the people that are being successful on YouTube just buckled down, shifted their focus, worked on something else for a little while and just kept moving on while the people that are struggling went into panic mode. And when you panic, when things don't go right, that's what's going to cause you difficulty. So you've got to get control of what's going on in your mindset in order to be successful on YouTube. One of the things that I've noticed is one, people don't panic. Uh, two, though, one of the keys to being successful long term with the mindset is realizing that you are not YouTube's customer. One of the things that I have found is a lot of people think of themselves, a lot of creators are thinking of themselves as YouTube's customers, and they're complaining because YouTube is treating them badly as a customer. You are not the customer. You are the product they are serving to their customers. The viewers coming to your channel, those are YouTube's customers. And if you want your product, which is your video, given to more customers, you have to give YouTube what they want. What they want with their videos is viewer satisfaction. They say it all the time. Satisfy the viewers. Constantly improving your content and trying to satisfy the viewers. And not just the viewers that are already on your channel. Not the ones that are just subscribed to you. If you're only making content for the people that are subscribed to you already, you're not going to grow your channel. You have to make content for people that you want to attract to your channel that don't know who you are. 70 to 80% of your traffic should be people that have never heard of you before. And are you making content that satisfies those viewers? If you want to grow 
with video, you have to satisfy people that don't know who you are, that don't already have that relationship with you. Okay, Jenny, waiting on a doctor's call, so you may have to scoot out early. <laughs> yes, waking up at 4 a.m. to check if you're YouTube famous is probably not the best. But you are YouTube famous, Adrian, so you don't have to worry about it. You and Stuart are crushing YouTube. If you don't know Farmstead Smith, y'all ought to check out her channel if you like her. If you like animals, she's witty. She's funny. She's got some really great videos. She has a beautiful donkey who loves to take over the camera. And she has bees. So donkeys and bees is a great combination. If you want to know more about animals, check out her Farmstead uh, homesteading channel. She does a really great job. So one of the keys that I've un come to understand is I've been growing Goonies never say die. That's a great way. YouTubers never say die. <laughs> never say die. Just keep going. Keep moving forward. Keep always trying to improve. Tr keep trying to move yourself forward. One of the biggest things that we've been looking at in that you've got to understand in your mindset, there's two key mindset principles I want to talk about. There's a lot of things I could talk about mindset, but there's two of them that really, really hit home. And when I made these two shifts in how I look at my channel, I, it completely transformed how I did YouTube. And I started seeing more and more success. One is what I was just talking about a few minutes ago which is that you are the product, not the customer. You've got to accept that your product, your videos that you're creating are what they're going to serve in the metadata, the information that we tell YouTube tells them who to serve it to. And that's what keyword comes from. That's where your descriptions come in. All that stuff tells YouTube who to serve your videos too. And if you're not doing these things properly, if you're just putting random titles in there, they're not serving your videos to new people, which means your channel's not growing. And you've got to work on if you want to grow and you don't want to grow, that's fine. You don't have to. If you want 10 subscribers, 100 subscribers, and you don't want more subscribers coming to your channel, then this is probably not the video with you, for you because this is how to stop struggling to grow your YouTube channel. That's what we're talking about today. Um, you know, that was the keyword that I use is stop struggling to grow on YouTube. And so because of that, that's what we're talking about. That's what this video is about because we're using a keyword and making our content relevant to the keyword. And there's a lot of people that don't get that. There's a lot of people that do what they call keyword stuffing. And I've never understood why people do this, where they, they try to target a keyword that gets high search volume, even though their video has absolutely nothing to do with that topic. And it doesn't make sense to me because yeah, you might get some views, you might get some clicks onto your video. And the second they see that this video has nothing to do with what they just came here for, they're leaving and going somewhere else, which is hurting your channel. So you also have to make sure you deliver on the promise of the keyword in the title that you use. You have to deliver on the promise. If you don't, then you need to change the promise. You can't change the content, but you can redo the keyword. You can redo the title, redo the thumbnail so that it makes a different promise than what you originally did. Especially I did that just a few weeks ago. I had a live stream that I did. And I didn't really, after I got some feedback from some people, I thought I did, but I didn't make the connection to fulfill the promise that I made in my title and my thumbnail. So I went back instead of saying, blaming YouTube or blaming my viewers for not understanding or not getting the connection. I had to go with this second mindset principle that I wanted to tell you about, which is I had to own full responsibility for my failure as a creator to connect the dots and to make that full leap. So what I did instead, I can't change the content. It's already made. So instead I went back, I did more keyword research. I found a new keyword that was more in alignment with what I actually covered in the channel. And so that I had a keyword in a title that delivers on the promise. I still some good content. It was still valuable content. It wasn't worth throwing away, but it didn't quite deliver on the original promise. So I changed the promise so that on the replay, people coming in will see what we went through on that live stream. 
that's one of the downsides to live stream content is sometimes you may not miss the mark. You know, when you're recording video, when you're recording content, you can go back and watch that content and compare it with your keyword and say, did I really deliver on this promise? Uh, when you're doing a live stream, sometimes you may miss the mark and sometimes you don't. Yeah, clickbaity. That's, that's where, and see, actually clickbait is not a bad thing. This is where people mispronounce and misuse the word clickbait. Clickbait simply means that you're enticing people to click on your content. There's good clickbait and there's bad clickbait. Good clickbait is when you make this wild claim and you deliver on that promise. Bad clickbait is when you make this wild claim and you fail to deliver on the promise. And I see a lot of people that are like, if you... I, let me give you a clue. If you have to put this is not clickbait in the title of your video, 90% of the time it, it is clickbait. Um, yeah, it's a lot harder on live streams to keep on track, but it's also, you know, I, I make connections in my mind, and this is something I have to work on constantly. I know I make connections in my mind, and I fail to portray that connection to the viewers and that's one of the things that i'm learning how to do better it's something i'm constantly working on uh, but sometimes i make a connection in my mind and how things relate and how things work together but i have to remember my viewers don't understand that connection yet because they haven't gotten to that point in their growth or in their understanding of how youtube works so sometimes i have to pull myself back and look at it whenever i'm recording a video I can go back, rewatch it, rewatch it, rewatch it, and see if I really made those connections. Whereas when it's live stream, I can't really redo those connections. I try to fix some of it in the comments by answering people's questions, uh, but it doesn't always work out right. Yep, the, your coop needs this, and then your video talks about what it is. And that's great clickbait. But when you say, you know, I'm going to teach you how to win Final Fantasy 14 and dominate the game, and then you do a video on Fortnite, I've actually seen people do this. And they're, they're like, well, why did you target that, that keyword for a totally different game? Well, because that one has more searches. Well, it doesn't matter if it has more searches if your content has nothing to do with that. And I see people do this stuff. I see people where their content had absolutely nothing to do with it, or maybe they spent three seconds of their video on something that had to do with what was in the title, but then they have like a 20 minute video and like three or 10 seconds of their video actually had anything to do with what they said in the title. Yeah, Jules, my mind races. I'm very ADHD. That's why you can see I don't, you know, sit still and do my presentations like this. I would go absolutely nuts if I was just sitting still. I'm always moving around. I'm ADHD. And if I'm not moving my body, I'm at least moving my head, moving my arms. I have to be moving constantly because I'm ADHD. And that hyperactivity, I'm constantly moving. I'm constantly going, 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 going. Hello, Pick with Joy. Hi, Kathy. You just go live just to see if I show up. I haven't been showing up this week. I'm not mad at you or anything. I've just been super, super busy. And I'm going to talk about why I've been super busy here in just a minute. It's one of the other tips I'm going to be talking about. Uh, so one of the things that we've been doing, once you get your mindset right, one, realize that you're the customer or you're the product, not the customer. But two, take full responsibility for everything that's failing on your channel. You have to, if you're not getting served to more people, if you're not getting enough impressions in your analytics, if you're not being served to more people, it's because you didn't pick good enough keywords for YouTube to know where to place you in search. If you're not getting clicks on those views to come see your channel, it's not YouTube's fault and it's not the customer's fault, it's because you weren't compelling enough with your title and thumbnails. This is where you have to own responsibility for the success and failure of your channel 100%. Stop blaming YouTube. Stop blaming the customers. Stop blaming other people for getting in the way. You have to own responsibility. If you don't post your weekly content, 
And I've done this myself. I didn't post my weekly content. I took a four month break from YouTube. I lost a bunch of subscribers. I have a bunch of subscribers still subscribed, but haven't been back to my channel since I took that four month break. You've got to take responsibility for that. And I had to own responsibility for that. And when I did, things started shifting. Things started changing. When I started taking responsibility for not getting enough clicks, not getting enough impressions, I started doing better keywords. I started getting more traffic. When I started getting uh, taking responsibility, y'all, some of y'all that have been watching me know my thumbnails have been going in very, very strange and different directions. Those of y'all been watching me for a long time know that my thumbnails have changed drastically. And it's because I'm testing different styles of thumbnails. I'm testing different ways of creating thumbnails uh, because I'm working on, that's one of my main areas of focus right now on every video I'm putting out on all my channels is the thumbnail design. Uh, that's one of the biggest areas I'm focusing on because I'm trying to improve my click through rate. And I'm thinking I'm hitting on some. I've got one right now that I just put out last week that's performing at about a 10.5% click through rate. It was at 11. It's dropped off in the last couple of days. But that's a tremendous improvement because pre- previously I was getting 1.5 to 2% click through rate on my thumbnails. Uh, so this is something we're constantly learning, growing, trying to improve what we're doing and trying to learn from what other people are doing and studying what other people do. When I started learning about thumbnails, I was studying other people's thumbnails for hours on end, looking at thumbnails, looking at, okay, what is it about this thumbnail that's compelling? Why is this video getting thousands of views? Okay, here's one. I really like that thumbnail. Why does this video only have 10 views on it? What and looking at and trying to break down what works and what doesn't work in thumbnail design. And it's something that I've spent weeks doing this. This is not something that's going to happen overnight. I've been doing this for weeks and I'm just now starting to see some progress and starting to see some progression in my thumbnail design as I've been testing different things. And that's the key. One, you have to study it, but two, you have to practice it. I had a comment the other day. I had somebody come to me asking me for help with growing their channel and how they could grow their YouTube channel. And so I talked to them for a few minutes. We talked about some things to do and how YouTube works. And then I said, well, let me check out your channel and I'll give you some advice on how to improve it. First thing I found when I went to his channel, zero videos. You want to grow a YouTube channel, you have to create videos. You're not going to grow a YouTube channel if you don't have any videos on your channel. You've got to start putting out videos. I don't care how bad they are. Look at some of my first videos. They were terrible. And then look at my old channels. And then also you have to realize, and this is something I want you to understand, YouTube is a long-term game. It is not short-term. When I talk about long-term, I'm not talking a month, two months, three months, six months. I'm talking years. And let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. I've had YouTube channels on YouTube for over 12 years, and I'm showing you one of my absolute terrible videos from 12 years ago. This is a video that I did on how to resize, uh, how to create and resize a canvas in paint.net, which is a free uh, graphics uh tutorial uh, for making this is a program that you can download and you can use it for making thumbnails and stuff it's not that great uh, but at the time this is what I was using for uh, images for my blogs and things like that Um, now look at this channel only had 88 subscribers this is 12 years ago y'all 2012 is when this particular video was I started this channel in like 2009 2010 but look right here 15,228 views. Now, whenever I was running this channel full time 12 years ago or 10 years ago, this video had like 45 views. In the last 10 years, this video has gotten 15,228 views. And it's not just, you know, okay, so it got 15,000 views years ago. Look at some of these comments six months ago, one year ago, one year ago, two years ago, three years ago. So, this has been getting views for years. So I want you to understand YouTube is a long term 
game. This is not something that's going to just take off overnight. And it's not something that just because it's not performing well today doesn't mean it's not going to in a year, two years, three years. I've seen videos take off explosively a year and a half, two years, three years after they were published. So don't think that just because you're not getting views now doesn't mean it never will. Sometimes it just takes YouTube a while to get it figured out where it goes in search. That video has been bringing me traffic to a channel I haven't even touched in over 10 years, and it's getting views for the last eight years. And it's blown up to over 15,000 views on that one video. And that's just one video on that channel. I have a couple of others that have blown up like that as well. I have one that has over 24,000 views. You know, so that's just an example of, you know, YouTube is a long term game. It is not a short term thinking. You have to think of the long game when you're doing YouTube. You also want to think when you're doing content then, and you need a good balance and a good mix, but are you creating content that's just for today? Or are you creating content that in a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, that content can still get views because it's still relevant to the people watching. That's something you need to take into account. And not every piece of content has to fit this. I do some content that I know in five years is not going to be relevant. When I do my step-by-step -step tutorials on how YouTube works, I guarantee you in five years, that stuff's going to be outdated and it's not going to be relevant content. But that's why I do a mixture of evergreen content, which is where I'm teaching and I'm sharing strategies. And these strategies work. Guys, the strategies I'm talking about today are the same strategies I was teaching 10 years ago. It's the exact same strategy. The technology, the tactics we use have changed because the technology's changed, but the strategic part, the strategic part of just trying to serve your customers, the strategic part of doing what you can to serve the audience instead of serving yourself, those things have not changed. It's the same way it was 10 years ago, and it doesn't change because human nature hasn't changed. Yeah, it's not going to be built overnight. It takes time. I I, I I built on that channel, <clears throat> the channel I was just showing off. I only have 45 videos on that channel. I only have like 88 subscribers, but I never promoted that channel. I never worked on building an audience on that channel. The entire purpose of that channel was free web hosting on YouTube for videos to embed on my blogs and websites. So all the traffic I was generating was being sent to my website, not to YouTube. Now I've realized that YouTube is much easier than running my own website. So I focus most of my attention on YouTube and I'm actually working in the background on building my websites so that I can funnel people into my websites so that I have my own domain. But at the same time, I'm serving people right here on the platform instead of serving them on my website. And by doing that, I'm able to grow much faster because YouTube already has the audience that I'm looking for. I think every single person, every one of you guys that's right here right now watching this video, and if you're watching this on the replay, I believe you can do it. It's not a matter if you can do it. The question is, are you willing to make the sacrifices necessary to make it happen? Are you willing to take the time? Are you willing to have the patience to allow YouTube to work for you instead of fighting and struggling? A lot of the struggle is because you're trying to force it to work instead of allowing it to work. And that's a huge, huge shift in the way you think. But I spent a lot of time on mindset, and I really didn't want to spend this long on it. I want to shift now and talk about some of the tactics that we're using right now that are working on YouTube. Uh, the first one is, and we talk about this all the time, but I still see people messing it up, is keywords. You have to have searchable keywords in your title. What do I mean? When you write the titles for your channel, you need to write your titles in ways that the content you're providing is searchable. So that means that somebody has a problem. They're going to go to YouTube and they're going to search how to fix my car, how to change a tire. And the more specific this can be, the more chances you're going to connect with the right people. And the more specific it is, the less search volume it is, the less competition there's going to be for that particular keyword. 
but the more those people are going to be highly focused and drawing the right people into your channel. And this can be difficult, especially if you're trying to do a wide variety of content. This is why variety channels struggle is because variety channels struggle to gain a consistent following because they might be targeting one particular niche today talking about recipes and cooking and they're talking about car repair the next day and reselling the next day well the people that subscribe for cooking information aren't going to care about your car repair they're not going to care about your reselling content so the large majority you might have a few that watch all of that content but the majority of people that subscribe to you are going to subscribe for that one purpose and one of the things i learned from sean cannell at think media never create content that somebody didn't subscribe for Never create a piece of content on your channel that your subscribers did not subscribe for. And that means niching down and keeping it focused on one thing for a while until you build that following. Now you can see other channels like Lonkers TV. He's all over the place. He's got a lot of different things. Uh, Mr. Beast. He's got a wide variety of different types of content. PewDiePie. But these guys have millions of followers. They've spent a long time, and if you go back and you watch how they started their channels, they were in a very, very small, tightly focused niche for a very long time, two, three, four years, building up their following, building up their reputation, building up. And then as they built that following, as they started getting a lot of traction and they had authority with people, then they started branching out and doing more variety in their content. That's the way YouTube growth works the best. You start really tight and really narrowly focused, and then you spread out and do more variety in your content as you build your following, as you build your reputation, as you grow and you have more authority over what people watch, because then you're going to have people that are going to watch content, no matter what it is, because they're invested in you as a creator, not just the niche that you started with. I have people that are following me over here that don't even run a YouTube channel because they're invested in me as a creator, not because they're trying to start a YouTube channel. And that's okay. So that's number one, start focusing in on a niche and on specific keywords that people are searching for. Number two, have a purpose behind every single piece of content you put out. I did a short video on this just yesterday where I said, you know, the number one thing you need to do is you have to have two purposes for every piece of content you put out. One is about your viewers. How do you expect your viewers to be transformed by the piece of content? It can be a huge transformation, it can be just a little bitty transformation. It's an idea that they hadn't thought of before. It's a way of thinking that they hadn't thought about before. It's a way of doing things that they haven't done before. They have a tip. They have a strategy. They have a step-by-step -step plan now on how to do something that they were struggling to do. That's a transformation. So what is it that you want your viewers to get? And you need to know this before you ever press record. The second one is what are, is in it for you? What are you planning to get out of this piece of content? If I want to get more, you know, do I want to get watch time from this content? Then I might do it as a live stream so that I get longer watch time. Do I want to get subscribers on this YouTube, on this channel? Then I need to make sure I give a clear and concise call to action telling people to subscribe to my channel in case they're new here. Do I want to make a sale? Then I have a product that promises to serve the problem. We're talking about the problem. We're talking about how to solve the problem. And then we show them a product in that video that will make solving the problem easier or bypass some of the struggle that we just talked about so that it's easier and faster for them. So you convince people to click on that link and buy that product. So this is why you have to know what is your end goal and you should have one for you and one for your viewers. One of the problems I see with a lot of channels is they're getting in there and then they're like, what? Click on this link, check out my YouTube, check out my Facebook, like my video, give me a subscribe, check out this next video over here. They're giving like 10 calls to action in one video. You're fragmenting where your audience is going at that point. You want to keep a tight focus and send your audience in one direction. Click this video here. Watch this next video. 
that's my call to action because I really want you to watch this next piece of content. Subscribe to my channel because that's why I want you to do today. That's what the purpose of this video is to build my subscribership to get more following. And we're going to talk about an easy way to get more subscribers in just a minute. But this is what you need to do. You have to have a purpose for every piece of content you put out. The next thing is the next tactic that you should be using if you're not right now. I've been talking to people about it a lot. Adrian knows what I'm talking about because she's seen the benefit of this already. Is YouTube Shorts. This new feature just rolled up about a month and a half ago. If you don't know what the Shorts feature is, it's where you do vertical format videos that are a minute or less and they are blowing up right now. And it's one of the biggest opportunities to grow your subscribership and to grow your channel right now. Now, I've got some videos right now. I've been testing videos on different channels. I have a channel that's nothing but shorts that I'm testing it out in a different niche. Uh, one of the shorts I put out on this channel just a week and a half ago, I think, I said, you know, one of the ways to test a new niche is to start doing short form content. And it's working for me. And not only am I able to test a new niche, I kind of cast a wide net with that niche. I did about seven or eight shorts on different topics, I've already figured out, and I've only been doing this for a week, I've already figured out I have one topic that I've done a couple of videos on and they have five times more views than any of the other videos. So now I'm honing in on, okay, what did I talk about in those videos that I can focus this down even more and have an even tighter niche? And so, I mean, one of them is starting to blow up. It had 67 views on it, I think, this morning uh, when I checked it out. So it's going huge. Uh, my storage scavenger channel, I did a, some shorts from the last storage unit that I cleaned out. I just did a couple of short clips, and I have one of those about to hit 1,200 views today. I've already gotten 13 new subscribers through that short. I got another. I had 12 last night. Got another one overnight. Um, so. That one is continually growing. It's still, it's kind of hit its peak. It's on its way down, which I've noticed with shorts, they kind of go up and they stay for a few days and then they go down. But shorts is really powerful right now for building views, building subscribers. Now, there's a few things about the shorts feature you have to understand. The watch time from the shorts shelf does not count towards your monetization goal. So, you're not going to, one, it's very short anyway. So if it's less than a minute long, you're not building a ton of watch time. Although if you're getting thousands of views for a minute, that's a lot of watch time. But at the same time, that watch time does not count towards monetization. You cannot monetize on shorts at this time. That might change. Remember, anytime something new comes out, it's going to change and develop over time. Uh, but then you need to be using shorts because the reason I say you need to be using shorts because it's helping build subscribers. I've gotten over 12 new subscribers through this one short that's taking off on my storage scavenger channel. My other channel that I'm testing things on, I just started this one. The short came out two days ago. It's already starting to get a lot of views. I've already gotten five new subscribers through that one short alone uh, on that channel. And it's a it's a small channel. And it's just starting to take off. I think that one may hit the thousands of views as well. I just posted it a couple of days ago. So we're going to watch it, track it, and see how it works over time. I know with this new one, I was getting, I'm getting approximately uh, one subscriber for every hundred views off of that view. And the thing is, is that video that's taken off on Storage Scavenger, it only has a 1.5% click-through rate. It's not getting a huge click-through rate for the impressions. But because it's getting so many impressions and it's keeping engagement, it's got a 68% watch time. So I'm keeping people through 68% of the video. The majority of people coming to it are watching three quarters of the video, almost over, over half, almost three quarters of the video. So because of that, it's keeping people engaged. And so YouTube is recommending it to more and more people, even though it has a low click through rate. Yes, you can monetize with uh, the short shelf, uh, with the ones, the views that are not on the short shelf. Here's the thing, and one of the things that they're beta testing, right now we're just posting videos with the hashtag shorts. 
that's going away when they finish the beta test with the system they're not going to show up on your channel anymore it's going to be more like i think it's going to be more like the stories where you actually record it right there inside the youtube app and it doesn't even show up on your main channel yeah on the short self it's not counting um but it's still my click through rate on the actual video because if you actually look at your analytics i was diving into my analytics yesterday on the short and when you look at your analytics the numbers are really screwy and so i had to figure out these are shorts clicks and these are because it's actually got different analytics for the short shelf than from your regular video okay impressions Okay, I have a troll. So I'm going to show you my troll. See, I have a troll. That's an impression of my troll. I showed it to you. Okay, so see my troll? I showed it to you. Click through rate. So when it comes to your video, that means YouTube showed your video to a potential viewer. It could have been on a recommended video as far as like showing up next to somebody else's video in their recommended videos. It could have been somebody searched for a keyword, a term in search, and they showed your video saying, here's this video that we think is relevant to that search term. It could have been somebody logs into their homepage. That's an impression. Every time YouTube shows that thumbnail and that title, to a potential viewer, that is an impression. It could have been in your notifications. When you get the notifications and they show that thumbnail and title, at, hey, such and such person just posted this video, that's an impression because you saw that in your notifications. Click-through rate is when somebody actually sees that and they click on it to go watch the video. That's your click-through rate. So the di difference between impression and click-through rate is impression is YouTube showed it. Click-through rate is when people click it and watch it. Now, this is important to understand because if you don't have impressions, the number one key to impressions is keywords. The number one key to getting more impressions is focusing in on keywords that tell YouTube where to place this video and then where you place those keywords there's three places you need to be placing your keywords and really there's four one of them is actually in the content itself uh, this is why you need to do your keyword research before you record if you realize whenever i started this video well we had sec silence at the start of the video because i didn't turn my microphone on but i told people the very first thing in my hook whenever i opened my video i told people i'm going to help you uh, in the struggle with video, uh, with growing with video, because that's part of the keyword phrase. I dropped that keyword phrase I was targeting in the opening line of my channel, of my video. YouTube's AI has learned how to listen to the audio. And so they could hear, you should be saying that keyword at least once within the first two minutes of your video. The next thing is it needs to be in your title. It needs to be in the title and your title and your thumbnail should not have the exact same words. You should not be trying to stuff your title onto your thumbnail. Instead, your thumbnail needs to complement your title. It needs to tell the story of the promise that your title is there to give. For example, if you looked at the thumbnail for this video, I only had three words on this video. 2020 grow with video. YouTube analytics is one of the most important things. And a lot of people don't get it. I spent a lot of time when I was new, not looking at my analytics. Now I look at them. I don't look at them all day, every day. I think some people waste more time uh, staring at their analytics that they could be spending creating more content. But instead, I do try to look at my analytics once or twice a week. 
and one and really a couple of times it's just doing a quick glance to look at things to see if the content that I'm making is working. But then the other one, I do a deep dive once a week where I'll sit down for about two or three hours and really dive into what's working and what's not working on my channel on specific videos and really diving into trying to figure out how people are reacting to my content. And it's all by reading the analytics and starting to understand the analytics. And I've got some videos coming out on how to understand the analytics and what you're looking at. Uh, I'm still diving deep into that myself. Um, and I've kind of gotten myself to a point where I feel comfortable enough with my knowledge of it to share it with other people. So I'm working on some videos coming out in the next couple of weeks on how to do that. Okay. Is it a detriment to have a long title? And why? The why is because you have to remember, if you look at your analytics, which we just talked about, one of the factors it tells you in there is where your views are coming from. Desktop, mobile, TV. It tells you in your analytics where the views are coming from. Most channels that I talk to, 70 to 80% of their views are coming on a mobile device. A mobile device only shows 70 characters of a title. So if your title is longer than 70 characters long, it's going to be cut off and people aren't going to see it. That's why they say put your keyword within the first 60 characters. So you got a little bit of wiggle room. So is a long title a detriment? Yes, because the majority of viewers are coming from mobile and mobile cuts off those titles. Uh, usually it shows up on desktop, the full title. Um, you want compelling language. The thing with your title is it's got to have two things. It's got to be your keyword has to be in there intact, fully optimized. And if you don't know how to do your keyword research, if you don't know how to pick out good keywords for your channel, I recommend using TubeBuddy. There's a link below in the description. I use TubeBuddy to find keywords and to judge the competition of those keywords. There's a couple of them. There's VidIQ, TubeBuddy, Morning Fame. Uh, there's a few others out there. Those are the three most popular ones. But these are tools that help you judge the competition and judge how competitive keywords are, how much search volume keywords are, and kind of give you a score that tells you whether or not you have a chance of ranking for those keywords. Uh, because if you target a keyword, so like, you know, I'm into the YouTube creator space. If I just targeted, say, do SEO on YouTube videos. And I know this one because I've actually looked at this one. I don't have a chance in heck ranking for that keyword phrase because that phase is owned by Nick Zneman, Think Media, Daniel Vital, Brian G. Johnson. These are all the authority channels within this community, within this niche, and they dominate. Each one of those has two or three listings for that particular search term. I know because I was looking at it just a couple of days ago, but instead, if I go for a long tail keyword phrase, let's say, do SEO for YouTube quick and easy with better keywords. That's a long phrase. But there's hardly any competition properly optimized for that long of a phrase because people are lazy and they don't want to optimize for that long of a phrase. Not only that, I am still optimized for the shorter keyword phrase within that do YouTube SEO because it's in my title. It's already in the long tail phrase. So I'm still optimized for that shorter phrase. So as I build authority over time, I have a chance to rank for that more authoritative keyword. The other one has a lot less search volume, but it has a lot less competition. If you can get a, if you're trying to rank for the keywords that have maximum search volume, but there's too much competition, you know, you're trying to get a, a keyword that gets maybe a hundred thousand searches a month because it gets a hundred thousand searches a month, but you're trying to compete against all the big guns in your niche for that keyword. You're not going to stand a chance. So you're going to have zero views coming to that word for that keyword. Instead, you go for the long tail keyword that has less competition and you can rank number one for that keyword. And that keyword might get 10 searches a day. 
but I'd rather have 10 visitors a day than zero visitors a day because I'm trying to target a keyword I don't have a chance to uh, stand a chance to rank for. So that's one of the keys to keyword research. Go for those long tail phrases that have less competition. You'll rank better. And then over time, you build your authority and you can go for the more competitive keywords. And that's where your traffic starts to snowball. When you start ranking for the better keywords, the bigger keywords, you get a trickle of traffic to start. You get engaged with people. You get people watching your content. YouTube sees people are watching your content. Then they'll serve it to more people. Also, one of the things I have found is when I go for the more long tail keyword phrases, I show up in recommended videos a lot more often. So I start showing up on other people's videos. And I've seen my videos showing up next to Nick Nimmons. D. Nimmons, Brian G. Johnson's. I've seen some of the videos on this channel. This is a new channel. I've got about 24 videos on this channel now. But I'm already starting to show up and recommended on some of the bigger channels. I'm getting some traffic from those recommended videos sitting next to some of the bigger channels. So that's one of those keys that you're going to start looking at over time. You want SEO is about getting next to one is about getting ranked in search, but it's also about getting put next to the right videos on recommended videos because you can get a majority of your traffic over time. This takes time, takes building authority, but over time you can build it up to where you're getting the majority of your traffic from recommended, not from search. That means somebody's watching a video on one of the authority channel sites and your video is right there and people click on it and they come check out your channel. <clears throat> so that gets us into keywords we need to get into using short content and using the shorts is again you still have to optimize it because that's telling youtube where to show it where to place it in those shorts again that's where i'm getting some traction on some of my shorts because my shorts are showing up on underneath the videos recommended underneath the videos of some of those authority channels and because my shorts showing up on some of their channels and they have thousands of viewers a day on their channels i'm able to get a few of those viewers to check out my channel and my shorts and again the titles have to have two things they have to have the keyword but then the second part is it has to be compelling i put in this keyword struggle the struggle to grow on youtube the reason why is that struggle is the compelling language that I was using to get people interested in what I was talking about, overcoming that struggle and starting to be successful with their videos. The second thing is like the other day, one of the most popular videos on this channel is the live stream that we did a few weeks ago. And I said, prepare for explosive growth. Why? Because explosive growth was the compelling element that I was targeting with that video. And it's one of the most popular videos I've done. I've got a lot of positive feedback on how we did that video. It was a live stream. And it was all about how to set your channel up for success. But the compelling element was the explosive growth. In my thumbnail, I put explosive growth on YouTube. And I had a bomb explosion behind me in the background as part of the element because I was talking about explosive growth in my title. I wanted that explosion on my thumbnail. So this is where you have to, your thumbnail should tell the story of your title. It doesn't have to repeat your title. It needs to tell the story of your title. Yes, you have to pay attention. I always recommend you need to look at how is your thumbnail going to show up on mobile because, again, more people are viewing on mobile. Also, the text, the fonts that you're using. These things are important because most people are only going to look at your videos on a mobile device. If your fonts are off, they're hard to read on a mobile device. If you're using really fancy fonts, they're hard to read on a mobile device. It might look great in the big screen, but it looks terrible on a, on a small device and it gets lost. Yes, your shorts right now, they do still show up as a regular video. So you can still get views. You can still get watch time. You can still monetize them. If you're monetized, you can still 
monetize the shorts on your channel. And like right now, one of the things I'm testing is I'm taking those shorts that are doing really, really well and getting me subscribers. And I'm putting those as my channel trailers because it's short. So when people come to my channel, they're going to get a very short bite-sized piece of content. It's a piece of content that's proven to keep people interested long enough to view it. And it's proven to convert to subscribers. So I'm using those as my channel trailers for when people come to my channel who aren't subscribed to me. I take whatever's my most popular short. That's what I'm showing to people uh, for the returning subscribers in that channel trailer. Whatever's the most popular short I have. Again, it's going to give them a bite-sized chunk of my content really quick, really easy. And it's one of my most popular videos. And that's also helping drive more views to that content, which is going to help YouTube know to serve it to more people. And leverage. It's all about leveraging what's working. One of the key elements I learned from Daniel Batal, if nothing else, is to focus on what's working. Part of the reason why I've doubled down on the engagement side, I've, I was actually planning on doing about five to 10 videos on the video engagement, how to create more engaging content. And then I was going to do more video editing tutorials and more behind the scenes tutorials. But the reason why I've kept the engagement content going is because that's what's working. That's what's connected. I did some of the tutorials and I've done some of the uh, video editing and my engagement videos are getting the most watch time. They're getting the most engagement. They're getting the most feedback and they're getting, and now they're starting to get the most views. <clears throat> so whenever I'm looking at the whole picture of how my channel's working, that's why I've doubled down and I've kept working on the engagement and how to create more engagement with your channel with my videos, because that's what's working on this channel. That's what's connecting with people. That's what's getting people coming in and commenting and bringing it back and sharing it with other people. So those are the things that I want. So that's why I doubled down on that type of content instead of going back and doing more of the tutorial videos. I'm still going to do some, but I'm going to be doing the engagement videos and then sprinkling in some of the tutorials here and there uh, as I use the engagement side to one, that's something that, and we were talking about this at, in Dean Nimmons group the other day, Adrian, this is one of the things I'm using to set myself apart from the competition as well, because none of the other channels are talking about the engagement. None of the, they talk about it. They say, yeah, you need to do more engaging content. And then that's it. And people are left. And I go into their comments and people say, how do you create engaging content? And nobody was answering it. They're just telling you, you need to do it, but nobody was telling you how to do it. So that's where I said, I'm going to focus on teaching how to do this through my channel. That's why I'm doing so many videos on how I create the avatars, how I talk to people, how I do my presentation styles, how I bring emotion to my videos. Those are the reason why I'm doing those kind of videos is because people are asking for that content and nobody is serving that need. I had to go outside of the niche and into the public speaking niche to learn how to do some of this stuff so that I can bring it into the YouTube community. And that's one of the things you want to do. You want to define yourself separate from the other channels. The reason why with the storage scavenger, the reason why I started doing so much how to do reselling content isn't because I'm the best reseller. It's because none of the other storage auction channels were doing it. And they were, there were people telling you, you know, you can resell this stuff and telling people what they could do if they wanted to get into the business, but they weren't teaching them how to do it. And people were asking in the comments, how do I start doing this myself? How do I resell this stuff? How do I research this stuff? How do, so I started taking all those questions on people were asking in other live streams and in other people's chats and comments on their videos. And I started answering them with my content. And that's why I built up the storage scavenger the way I did, because people were asking for that information and now they have a resource where they can learn it. And it set me apart. I don't do as many storage units as those other guys. I'm not as good as a reseller as some of those guys are, but I'm the only one making the content on how to do it. And now they're and through me that I'm, I'm actually always referring people to other channels that are better at doing different things. You know, if somebody comes to me asking questions about t-shirts that they found, I send them to Matt Romero because he's an expert at 
t-shirts. He's focused in on that very, very tight niche of just doing the t-shirts. And that's where his expertise is at. So I refer people to him all the time. And, you know, that's the thing is you start honing in on what sets you apart from the other people in your community. And then you find other experts. Like for me, if you come to me with questions about how to do stuff on mobile, I can give you a few tips and a few strategies because I've done a lot of stuff on mobile. But in most cases, I'm going to send you to Dean Nibbon. Why? Because he's the expert on how to do mobile uh, YouTube. So you've got to do something that sets yourself apart from the competition and that's going to help you grow your channel faster. That's going to help you. That's going to give other people a reason to recommend people to you instead of just answering the questions themselves. You know, I'd much rather send you to D because he's probably already got a video on his channel on how to do what you're asking me to do. And that's the way it works. That's, that's how you get stuff. If somebody comes to me and asks a question about how to live stream with Streamlabs, I don't know. I don't use Streamlabs. But I know Doug Houston YT does. So we'll send people over to Doug Houston. If somebody comes to me and asks for questions on how to train their moderators, how do I teach my moderators to do a better job? Doug's got three playlists on moderators on how to be a better moderator on his channel. So I'm going to send them over there. I try to be actionable. I don't try to just give general advice. Here's the thing, though. One of the things, because I'm new, I don't have products to sell. I'm not trying to sell you something. I can give that kind of advice. A lot of these experts are holding back information that they share in their products, that they share in their coaching, in their other resources, in their members areas. I don't have all that stuff in place. So I don't have anything to lose by holding it back. I don't have anything to gain by holding it back. I don't have anything to lose by sharing it. And for me, you know, I share tips and tactics, but whenever I do create products, when I get into my consulting, which we're going to do here in a little while, not today, but, you know, here in a, a little while, as far as in a few months, in, a, in about a year or so, we're going to start a, a coaching service where we're actually coaching people once I prove myself a little bit more and grow this channel a little bit. Uh, but one of the things that we're going to do with that is I, I give you every little piece of nugget of advice that you need. I will share every single tactic, trick, tip that I know right here on my channel. But to put them all in order and to put them in the right strategic order to make it all flow and work properly, that's what we sell in our coaching. That's what we sell in our programs and in our courses is that strategic part that tells you step by step how it all fits together. Because that's the thing is I'm telling you everything you need to know to be successful on YouTube throughout my channel. But I don't tell you how all the pieces fit together. And it's not trying to be mean. It's not trying to hold back from people. It's one, I like giving it in bite-sized chunks that you can apply. If you're looking for this piece of information, it's right here. And you can go apply this to your uh, channel instead of overwhelming you with the entire strategy. But the other part of that is, is that gives me something in reserve that that's part of what we're going to sell later on when we create our products, when we do our coaching, we do our stuff. And, and some of that stuff is going to be like, that's why we do coaching, because some things will be specific to specific channels. But I've done coaching before. I did coaching on blogging 10 years ago, and I can tell you that 90% of the advice I gave every coaching client was the exact same. It was about five to 10% that was specific to that individual, but 90 to 95% of what we were saying was the exact same thing to everybody. Dougie is great. Yeah, I love Doug. Am I still a full-time reseller? Yes, I am right now. Um, I don't know if you watched some of my previous videos. My goal right now, because this channel is, you know, free content that I'm doing. And I'm, I'm not monetized yet. I just started this channel about a month and a half ago. Uh, but my goal is to work on some passive income streams through this channel and through another channel that I'm running and replace my income from reselling. I'm still going to do the reselling. I'm still going to do the storage scavenger. I'm still going to be doing my auctions on YouTube, but 
I'm going to be doing that more as a part-time side hustle because I love doing it. I enjoy doing it, but this is what I'm passionate about. I love diving into people's YouTube channels. I love seeing, and honestly, I love seeing somebody else explosively grow. That's why I love watching Adrian's growth. I love watching somebody else's success a lot more than my own. Uh, I can see a ch channel taking off and I'm like, woohoo, yay, it's taking off, it's doing good. And then I see somebody else do the same thing and they're taking off. I'm like, yeah, get it, get it, you go. I'm much more excited about seeing somebody I've helped or somebody I've talked to be successful than I am about doing it myself. Uh, so that's why I love this YouTube stuff and I love the mindset stuff. You know, I talked about that in the beginning. I have a channel that's just about my mindset, mental, uh, emotional, spiritual things. And I have a channel that's just dedicated to that stuff as well. A few people have found it. I don't share it publicly because it's one of my testing grounds where I'm testing different features and different things inside YouTube. Uh, right now I'm, I've got set up where I'm just doing short content on there because I'm testing the shorts feature on that channel and testing different things with the shorts feature on that channel. But <clears throat> I'm going to be doing some more long form content on that channel later on as well. But yes, I am still a full time reseller uh, right now. I am going to be a part time reseller, full time YouTuber. I'm kind of in that transition phase, but it takes some time. Thank you, Pick with Joy. Yeah, I mean, I try to help people to grow. I want people to actually be able to walk away. This is one of the things I talked about earlier. Do you have a purpose for that content? One of the purposes, I want to make sure I'm giving you actionable advice that you can take and actually apply. A lot of these guys, they're teaching stuff. They're talking about tactics. They're talking about things to do. But you walk away and you're like, okay, I still don't know what to do. And that's why they get the same questions over and over again, over again. You know, I see, and there's some people that just aren't going to apply it too. One of the things, and this is another little key to being successful with video as a mindset thing that you need to understand. And this is a, as a content creator, if you're an educational content creator, especially one of the things that you have to accept, and this isn't against anybody here. I guarantee you one person out of everybody here is going to take what I'm talking about today and apply it to their channel. One, because I can look at the numbers because less than 10% of the people you teach will actually apply what you teach, whether it's for free or in a paid course. Uh, I was listening to some statistics just the other day, less than 10% of the people that buy a personal development program. And trust me, I've spent thousands of dollars on some of these programs and I've been guilty of it myself. Less than 10% of the people that buy a personal development course, complete that course. They actually complete it. And out of those about five to 10% of those people actually apply what the course taught to their lives and actually make a change. So you're looking at about a 1%, half a percent to 1% of the people that actually buy a course actually use it. And there's people spending thousands of dollars. They have a high attrition rate. <coughs> it's crazy. You have to realize that the majority of people that consume your content are not going to apply it if you're trying to teach something. And once you get that, and it clicks with you. I'm not trying to trash people. It's not a bad thing. But once I accept that, then I can accept that it's okay. As long as I'm sharing my message, what's more important is I'm doing what I can to share the clearest message I possibly can. And what people do with it is up to them. If you take it and you apply it and you kill YouTube because I told you to do something, great for you and I want to know about it. But if you don't apply what I said, and then you want to sit back and you want to blame me because you failed on YouTube because you didn't do what I told you to. That's on you. It's not my fault. I did what I could. But I see a lot of people that are not doing that. So I said I was going to talk about three things. We talked about SEO, keyword research. We talked about shorts. The number one thing that I have done to blow up my channel, and I talk about this all the time, is getting out there in front of your community. 
And if you don't have the community on your channel, are you getting out on other people's channels and getting in front of the community there? So are you going out to other live streams? Are you going out to helping other people? Are you going out and getting up on other people's channels, doing collaboration videos with people, getting in touch with your niche directly? That is number one, one of the biggest things I've done to grow the storage scavenger channel. It's one of the things I'm already working on. I've got three different collabs in the works right now for this channel with different people, three different collabs. I'm already working on the details with people to do for this channel. And that's just three that I've got working right now. I've already got some feelers out to possibly do some more. Um, and the reason why is because that's one of the number one things I've done to grow my channel. That's what I did with the storage scavenger. Most of my subscribers, when I started the storage scavenger started, I sat at 20 subscribers, 25 subscribers for like three months. No growth. I didn't understand. I wasn't using the SEO. I wasn't, you know, getting out there. I went to the bad boys of reselling. Those of y'all that know Alex, fat man, the flipper. I hope he's doing well. He disappeared from us. Uh, but he invited me onto his show. He he opened the panel. I jumped in there. I went from 25 to 30 subscribers. I'm like, man, I got 10 subscribers at once. And there are people that don't know me. I was excited. I was like, woo, I'm blowing up. Because I went up by 10 subscribers in one live stream. So a couple of weeks later, he did it again. That's when I met Justin Grimes from Grimes Finds. He invited me up to Dallas to do a collaboration with him. There was five channels there. What the hells? Crocker's Lockers, Because She Shed, uh, Life After the Before Photo, and me. Five channels did a big collab. All of us were kind of smaller channels at the time. I think Robin was the biggest one, and she had like two or 300 subscribers on Because She Shed at the time. Um, the rest of us were just kind of getting started. Did this big collaboration. By the end of that weekend, I had over 250 subscribers. I went from 25 to subscribers to 250 subscribers in two weeks because of collaboration, because of getting out there and networking with my niche and getting involved in the collaboration and getting out there and getting to know people. I could have had more, but my channel sucked at the time. If I had good titles and good thumbnails, if I had optimized my channel the way I'm optimized now, I probably could have had five to 600 subscribers through that collaboration. Because I had over a thousand people come to my channel in the next few days after that collaboration. Only 250 of them subscribed to my channel. I had over a thousand people sent to me from that one collaboration. It could have put me at five, 600 subscribers had I been optimized properly to capture that success. For me, it was a great growth and it was a great lesson. And I also learned by that collaboration, not only did we do the collaboration videos, I spent a lot of time with What the Hells and with Grimes talking to them about how YouTube works. Because both of them were growing. Both of them, you know, What the Hells, almost 100,000. I think they just passed 100,000 subscribers earlier this year. Uh, Justin's getting really close to 100,000 subscribers right now. He's at like 78, 79,000. Um, so I talked to them for a long time about how YouTube works. And over the next several weeks, I talked to both of those channels. Now, there are some things that both of those channels have done since then that I disagree with. I still follow them. I still learn from them. I still watch their content. Uh, and I still communicate with them because I'm still learning from them. But the relationship's changed a little bit over the last year. Um, but they still, they I learned a lot about how YouTube works. And so I started implementing some of the things I learned from them into my channel. And I started getting out and networking with more people. And by doing those things, I was able to grow. And honestly, I was on a path of growth. I went from zero subscribers, you know, 20 subscribers up to, uh, 250 subscribers over the next month and a half. I went up to 500 subscribers by just getting out networking with people, talking to people. And then I took a four month break. Now, one of the keys to successful growth on YouTube is momentum. And if you're in a momentum and you're explosively growing, you don't stop for four months. One of the biggest mistakes I made on YouTube was stopping for four months. Now, granted, there were some personal issues that had to be dealt with. 
that personal issues that I had, you know, a lot of issues that I was dealing with at the time. So it was necessary. It was important. It's something that happened to me that I had to go through, but it stopped the growth of my channel. And then July came around. I had to start over. I still had the subscribers, but those subscribers weren't coming to my channel. Some of those subscribers are just now starting to say, okay, you know what? He's making content again. He's been doing this for a while. Maybe he's going to stick with it. So they're starting to come back, but it's taken me four, almost four months since I started back up to get some of those subscribers coming back to watching my content. So even though I had all these subscribers, I wasn't getting very many views because they weren't coming to watch me. They come on, weren't checking out my videos. They weren't coming to my live streams. So that's something you have to be aware of when you stop the momentum for a long period of time, you lose the trust with people. You lose that momentum and then you have to rebuild that momentum again. And so that's what I did. I started rebuilding the momentum again, kind of backed off in the last month and a half or so. Uh, I kind of hit this low point at about 850 subscribers. We're starting to take off again. We're starting to build up again with the shorts and with, I'm still getting out there. Part of it's I kind of gotten out there with all the channels that I was already subscribed to and following a lot. Um, so I'm kind of looking for new avenues. There's, I mean, there's hundreds of channels within the reselling community. So I'm starting to get engaged with some of those other communities that I haven't engaged as much with, because I just can't make everybody's live streams. You know, I would love to, but I don't have all day, every day to spend on live streams. Uh, so I'm not as engaged on everybody else's live streams as I could be and should be. Uh, but I am getting more engaged in some of the other live streams. Uh, reselling wise but also i'm getting more engaged with some of the live streams with some of the stores auction channels and getting more engaged with their following with their communities and trying to rebuild what i had lost by uh, some of that so this is some of the things that you need to be focused on if you really want to grow is getting out there and networking and trying to get those collaborations. And especially, you know, when you start getting bigger, you can get collaborations with the bigger channels. So I see a lot of people, though, that are trying to go to channels that have 100, 200, 300, 400,000 subscribers, a million subscribers. And it's all when you approach those guys, how you approach them for collaboration is the number one key to success on whether you're going to get it or not. Well, now I'm soaked in muddy, but you were with me the whole time. Well, that's good. Um, but are you, when you go out to do a collaboration, or if you're trying to get a collaboration, are you going to people and saying, I want you to collab with me because I need subscribers? Because that's what 90% of the people that are asking the big channels to collaborate with them are doing. They're saying, I want you to collaborate because I need what you have. Why aren't you going to them and saying, hey, you have this audience. I'm teaching this and I think it would be of value to them. This is why setting yourself apart and doing those things that are different will help you because now you have something to bring to the table. You know, that's how Daniel Batal launched his YouTube channel on uh, Filmora and on his growth channel. He did a collaboration with Brian G. Johnson. And he documented the entire collaboration and he used that content and showed how he did this video uh, using Filmora. And that launched his Filmora channel where he's teaching people how to use Filmora and he's teaching tips and strategies on Filmora. I don't use Filmora for my video editing and I learn a lot of editing tips by watching Daniel's channel. <clears throat> now he was already, he already had another channel. He already had a relationship with Brian G. Johnson. This is another key. Build the relationship first and then ask for the collab. I'm building those relationships right now with other channels within my community, within my niche that I know that have a following. I think I could help with my engagement strategies with the things that I'm teaching here on my channel. I'm building those relationships right now. And whenever I feel like I'm at the point in those relationships where I could do a collab with them, I'm putting together an idea and I'm going to present it to them and say, this is the collab I'd like to do with you. This is what I want. This is all I need from you. I'm going to do all the editing. I'm going to do all the work. I think that we could really make this work and help a lot of people. So, but I have to script out the video. I got to have it all lined out. I got to 
say, these are the shots that I need from you so we can do this collaboration. And all they got to do is send me the footage and I'll do all the work and we'll put it out. That's one of the keys to doing a successful collaboration with another channel is being able to go to them and present them with the strategy instead of saying, gimme, 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 say, hey, I think you can do this. And I got this audience over here that doesn't know who you are. And I'd like to put you in front of them because these guys are always looking to grow. And so we we show their co that content. We do a collaboration. We put them in front of my audience and we're going to share that out with them. And I say, I know this skill right here. I think this could be really valuable for your community. What do you think? If so, I could do this video and give it to you. You could put it up on your channel and share it with your audience. Or, you know, you're doing a live stream. Hey, I'd like to jump on a live stream with you and talk to your audience about this. I've done this before. I've done this in the reselling community about this channel. I've jumped on other people's live streams. And I wasn't in there telling people, okay, hey, come subscribe to me. Come subscribe to me. No, we sat there and we talked for over an hour and a half on Johnny's channel the other day and totally took over his reselling live stream and talked about YouTube. Daniel's rag video was epic. Yes, that was absolutely an epic video. Trigger the algorithm. I mean... It's stuck in my head. I still sing it all the time. Do you think it's a detriment as a content creator to follow and engage with channels that are not in your niche? That's a good question, Adrian. And it depends on your niche. It also depends on what you're doing with your channel. What I mean by that is... I run on Storage Scavenger, an auction channel. There might be people in those other communities outside of the reselling community that would be interested in the stuff I'm selling in my auctions. So it might behoove me to go to other channels and engage with that niche. Go into other channels. Like I go into crafting channels. There's a lot of crafters that are trying to sell their crafts. Well, Guess what? I sell stuff through auctions. I sell stuff on eBay. I have a lot of value that can be relevant to them. That's what the key is, is. Do you have information that would be relevant to that audience? And is that audience relevant to your audience? It's not just about the niche that they're talking about. Is the audience, the audience, this is why having that profile of your ideal audience is important. That avatar we talked about in some of my other videos if you have that avatar, you'll know, is that avatar interested in this other niche as well? If so, there's a great chance of collaboration. When I was doing dating and relationship advice websites 15 years ago, yeah, I know I'm, I'm not the best one to give dating and relationship advice, but I didn't know any better at the time. I didn't know about passions and, you know, expertise and all that stuff back then. I was just, you know, doing uh, random websites, but I did websites on that. And I actually did collaborations with channels in the fitness niche because it was relevant to my audience to do that because, you know, people were wanting to date. They wanted to look better so they could get better dates. So we actually did some collaborations with a fitness channel and they got some new subscribers. I got some new subscribers and we both had people that were you know, relevant content. So it worked because we were in two different niches, but we had a common ground and we had a common problem that we worked together to help people solve. So if you have another community that's outside of your primary niche, but they have an interest that is relevant to your niche, absolutely collaborate. But if it's not relevant, I would not go, you know, as a eBay reseller channel, I wouldn't, I don't really go to channels that are, you know, drone shots. Cause those are not really relevant to my niche, you know, drone stuff. Just not really an element. Hello, Gary. Hope you're having a fantastic day. West side, Gary. Remember Goonies never say die. Most important thing of the day.
Goonies never say die. YouTubers never say die. Let's go. But yeah, collaboration is all about audience. Everything you do about YouTube should be, am I putting myself in front of the right audience? Is this the ideal audience? Is this people that would be interested in what I'm talking about on my channel? Are these the people that are going to, that I am trying to serve with my content? And if you have a problem that you're trying to solve that would serve a different audience, then absolutely get it in front of them. Um, and, you know, that works across niches, but it also works within the niche and different focuses of the niche. You know, maybe, you know, I know people that are trying to serve niche down within the reselling community. They only talk about eBay and other channels that only talk about Macari and Poshmark. Well, they're still both resellers and they both share a similar audience so they can still collaborate together. Um, you know, and I know like right here in this channel, you know, I'm talking about YouTube growth, but I've been out there talking to people in the reselling community about my YouTube growth channel. And that's part of how I, have you know, kickstarted and helped grow this channel was by talking to that niche because one, I was already engaged there with people. Uh, but part of it too, is I know a lot of people in those communities that are trying to build a channel or thinking about starting a channel. So it was relevant to that community for me to go and talk to them about starting a YouTube channel because they were interested in that or already doing it. So that's the thing is it's not about, you know, should I go to this niche or that niche? I wouldn't go to a gaming channel and try to talk about my reselling business because it probably wouldn't be relevant to their audience unless they're trying to sell their gaming system, you know, but for the most part, I wouldn't go there to try to sell reselling stuff. You know, I don't go into the woodworking community uh, to talk about my resale business, but I might go in there and talk to them about how to list stuff on eBay and Macari and Poshmark, how to sell stuff through their own channel, because those are things that I'm doing. And it doesn't matter if it's a home crafted item, like their woodworking stuff, or if it's an item I picked up at a thrift shop selling, it's going to be the same. The avenues to sell that stuff is going to be the same. So I'm just teaching you how to sell stuff using these platforms. But I don't go in there and trying to teach them how to go thrifting. I'm not going in there teaching them how to clean out an abandoned storage unit. I'm in there to share the content that would be relevant to them, which is how to sell their stuff that they're making in that woodworking community. Yes. When I started this channel, all of my interaction, when I first started this channel, all of my interaction, excuse me, all of my interaction was with the reselling community. And the focus was really kind of in the reselling community. But then as I started, you know, I started going to other channels because like if I'm going to do a YouTube growth channel, I need to really, really dive into studying YouTube growth. So I started going to Nick Nimmons, D Nimmons, and I was going to their lives like every once in a while, but I started going every week. And as I started going every week, I started noticing the questions that weren't being answered. I started answering those questions. That's how we met. That's how Nairi and I met. That's how me and Yomi met was by answering questions that people were asking in those chats. Just being nice, saying hi to people, greeting people. We talked about that last night. And then just answering people's questions in the chat that they weren't answering in the live stream. You know, because a lot of them like Nick, Indeed, they use their question form. So when people are asking questions in the chat, they're not getting answered a lot of times. So since they're using that question form to get their questions and they're not going through the chat questions, I was answering questions in the chat. And because of that, I built relationships with a lot of people very, very quickly. And some of those people are now coming to my channel. It's the same thing. And then you want to get out. And, you know, I'm not trying to get up on their live streams because... I'm a nobody in this niche. Yes, they're starting to know who I am. Dee knows who I am now. Um, and he knows about this channel. But Nick doesn't know about this channel. Daniel, I think, knows about this channel because he's given me some advice on it. Uh, but 
it's I'm not trying to get collabs with them yet. It's in the works. I'm working on this. Is what I was talking about earlier. I'm working on building those relationships, but I have already been on live streams with uh, creator content creator hangout. I've been on a live stream with them. Uh, his name is uh, Brandon and he's commented on my, I found him because he commented on some of my videos. I checked out his channel. I did a live stream. I jumped on a live stream with him a couple of weeks ago. Um, talked with his audience about YouTube growth. Um, so I'm starting to branch out more into the general community of creators instead of just staying focused on the reselling community. Uh, the same thing with your homesteading niche. You might start and, you know, kind of get your feet wet just serving that recent, that uh, homesteading community. But eventually you're going to have to decide, do you want to grow that channel? Because it's the problem with that community is only a certain percentage of that community is going to be interested in starting a channel. So if you try to stay in that tightly niche focus, it's a great place to start. But if you stay that tight, you're not going to grow past a certain point because you're going to get to a point where you've already served all the people that are interested in starting a channel. So then you can start branching out and coming out into a wider audience. But it gives you a great focus and it gives you a great way to differentiate your content because the way you create content and homesteading is going to be slightly different than how I do it as I do a storage unit. Hello, Tim. I hope you're having a great day. Thanks for joining us. So is there any other questions? If anybody's got any questions, feel free to leave them down in the chat. Uh, I think Adrian's pretty much been the one answer, asking most of the questions. So if, you, if you're trying to focus in on YouTube, uh, what is it that you want to teach? What is it that sets you apart from me, D, Nick, all these other channels that you get that you see other people not getting? And that's what you want to focus on. Um, and it's okay. This is like what I did here. I, I put out a lot of different content on different things when I first started. In the first week, I put out like 10 videos all on different topics. Happy birthday to Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's in the other room with the nurse at the moment. I will pass that along to her. Um, hope you're doing fantastic, Tim and Tina. But, you know, what's differentiating you from the rest of the community, from the other creators in this community? And then, you know, start searching there because there's, there's a lot of channels that are our size or smaller that are you know small just starting out channels in this community i can tell you <clears throat> this community it's a little bit harder to grow through live streaming and through connecting that way than it is in say the homesteading community because it's very active live streaming community uh the reselling community the auction community has a very active live streaming community and because of that, we were able to grow our channels a little bit faster than other channels. In this niche, it's one of the hardest niches because you're talking about YouTube growth and you don't have any growth on your own channel because you're new and people don't want to you know, be forgiving of that. You kind of have to pass a threshold. Usually once you get past monetization, it helps. But getting that first thousand subscribers is like a hard grind in this niche. And then uh, Daniel did it. D did it. Uh, a lot of these other channels have done it. Once they got past that thousand subscriber mark, it just exploded. Um, but there's just something in the mindset of people when you're under a thousand subscribers, you're not monetized on this in this niche yet. Then you must not know what you're talking about. Then once you get past that, it just kind of blows up. <clears throat> I'm interested in all your channels only because your channels is what I am. I love you because you're so well. that's one of the things I've tried to keep it, even though I try to be I'm trying to get better at editing so I can be a more polished version of myself in a way. Uh I try to keep it real. I try to keep it as real as I can and be true to who I am. One of my guiding principles I talk about in my mindset stuff is integrity. 
And if I, I, I don't really care what other people think about me, but I do care about what I think about myself. And if I don't feel like I've been true to my integrity, I can't publish the content. I can't get it out there. I can't do it. Um, and I've had videos that I felt like I wasn't being true to myself and I never published them. How many channels are you doing right now? Five. Four of them are actively getting content. I have one that we're working on that's about to be getting content. But it's going to be, it's a live stream. It's a weekly live stream Jessica and I are doing for families of special needs kids. And we ran it for several months or a while back. We've been through a few iterations with it, but we're fixing to revamp that channel and revive that channel. Uh, part of it is we were waiting for Jesse to get into daycare. Now he started daycare, so we're going to start that channel probably back up within the next few weeks. But I have, I have a couple of channels on mindset stuff that I'm testing different things on. I, I don't share that channel publicly. A few of y'all have found it. But I, I intentionally don't share it because I use it for testing different things uh, with the algorithm and with different things. I'm testing different SEO strategies. I'm testing shorts on there. I'm testing uh, different strategies with that channel. Uh, I had some different content on there and I deleted most of it because it wasn't relevant to what I'm doing with the channel now. And it didn't really have any views to lose anyway. And most of the, like the watch time, that channel, the, all the watch time on that channel was like two or three years old. So the watch time wasn't doing me any good anyway. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a testing ground that I'm using for testing some different changes and things that I'm, I'm testing some ideas I'm having and some of the strategic plans that I'm working on. I'm actually recording some of the stuff I'm doing on that channel as well. So I will reveal it one of these days, uh, but I'm not ready to put that out yet. It's okay. You can learn. I might get, I just, I might scare some of you off is my problem with that one because I get deep into the woohoo side of my life that I don't talk about on my scavenger channel. I don't talk about that side of my life in this channel. Um, but I talk about spirituality. So it gets into some deep topics that people might think I'm a little off after they see that side of me, but it's a huge part of who I am and how I make my decisions and everything that I do. So I, I have to share it somewhere. And that's one of my, honestly, that channel over there in this channel eventually will replace the storage scavenger not probably completely replace it i love the storage scavenger i love the community i have there and i'll probably keep doing reselling as a side hustle so i'll probably keep that channel going but it's going to be more of a side project that we do for fun while these are the ones that i'm going to use for one building up revenue for my family uh doing things to really increase our stuff and do some passive income streams um, and give me the ability to do some things that can work even when I have to take some periods of time off to take care of things for Emily. Like we know sometime next year, we're not exactly sure when yet. Jess, Emily's going to be in Dallas in the hospital for six weeks. It's going to be hard during that six weeks. I'm not going to say I'm not going to be able to do any content, but it's going to be hard for me to do my reselling business and do eBay stuff when I'm in Dallas and all my stuff is here in Austin. You know, it's a four and a half hour drive away and I can't drive back and forth every day to ship eBay stuff. So for six weeks, we're going to be stuck in Dallas with Emily in the hospital. I'm probably not going to be able to resell. I've got to get some things going so that we can still have income coming in and I can still do content on this kind of stuff no matter where I'm at versus my reselling stuff, I have to be home where I can sell stuff. So I'm trying to get away from physical products and do more digital products and the digital product market in the reselling community doesn't work. That community is adamantly against it. Um, and, and I'm okay with that attitude. Um, I don't agree with it, but I'm okay with it. People can, you know, do what they want to do. 
So, but in order for me to do what I need to do for my family, I've got to move away from having physical products that I need to be there for and do more digital stuff and stuff that I can take anywhere. I get into the woo woo, like the, the content on that channel right now that is taking off the most and I'm fixing to do a whole bunch of content on it is stuff on the law of attraction. Uh, and the understanding how that works and all that kind of stuff. And I'm getting deep into how the law of attraction works. I've been studying that stuff for over 30 years. Before it was called the law of attraction, I was already studying those principles and how that stuff works. So uh, that's stuff that I'm sharing on that channel right now. So this has been fun. One thousand is honestly, you will do more work. It's not so much that you'll do more work. Here's what I found, and other people can disagree with me or not, but I've even talked to other channels that have over a hundred thousand subscribers that tell me the same thing I'm fixing to tell you. Um, it's harder to get from zero to one thousand. As far as the work you have to do off your channel, like the networking and the getting out there and the hustling and trying to get people to your channel, that side of it, your workload is probably 75 to 80% just trying to get people to see your channel. Once you get past that thousand subscriber mark and get ranking in search, that's a really about where you start triggering the algorithm is when you get to about a thousand subscribers. And this is something I have learned. And some of the bigger YouTubers say no to this, but in my experience and from talking to other channels, it is so much easier to rank in search and to get you to promoting your content once you're monetized. Why? Because YouTube's a business and they're in business to make money. So if they're going to serve a video that going to make them money or they're going to serve your video that's not monetized and not making them any money, they're going to give priority. They're not going to not serve your video at all, but they're going to give higher priority to the one that's going to make money. So they're going to show it more. They're going to offer it to more people, giving them more opportunity to grow because that video is making them money. Your video is not making them a dime. It's just free content because you're not monetized yet. So once you get past that thousand subscribers, YouTube will give you a little bit more priority. It may not be a big push of priority, but it's a little bit. And that little bit can help a lot. Remember, YouTube's a business. We are their product. We are not their customer as creators. We are the product that YouTube is serving their customers. And just think about this. This is why we talk about optimization. This is why we talk about always improving your content. This is why I talk, spend so much time on how you deliver your content. Because if you look at YouTube as a business, okay, if I'm in business, you know, we resell. If I'm in business, if I'm a reseller and I go out and I buy a whole bunch of product and I put it up on eBay, and nobody goes to my eBay store and buys that product. And I eventually take all that product and donate it to give it away just to get it out of my inventory. I'm not going out and buying more of that product to serve to the same people on eBay. I'm going to go find a different product to serve on eBay. It's the same thing with your content. They're going to take that content and they're going to serve it out to their viewers. But if the viewers don't click and consume that product, or if they click, they consume that product and they immediately leave because they didn't like it, they're not going to keep serving that product over and over to more people. This is why you have to take responsibility for the success and failure of your channel. Because if YouTube is trying to serve it to people and people aren't taking it, their viewers aren't consuming that content, then they're not going to keep serving it to more viewers. You've got to remember your content is the product and the viewer is the customer. So 
that's why viewer satisfaction is the number one thing YouTube's looking at. Every metric they're looking at, it's me trying to measure viewer satisfaction with your content. Thumbs up, comments, likes, clicking on that end screen card. These are huge metrics for YouTube because it's showing people liked your content. When you do a live stream, you know what one of the most important things you can do on your live stream? It's looking at this little box over here on the left-hand side. Stay engaged with your chat. Because if you can keep your chat going, they're going to show it to more people. They actually know how many comments were made in your chat during the live stream. And the more comments you have, the more they're going to share that, con that live stream out on the replay. People don't know that. The more engaged your chat is, the more they're going to serve that out. Now, whether people consume that is going to depend on how well you hooked people in the beginning. Did you just do a random chat live stream? Because you can have a lot of engagement. You can get a lot of views, and that views bounce very quickly on a live stream on replay because it was just random, and it wasn't focused content. That's why I always start my live streams with about 15, 20, 30 minutes of focused content, and then we get into the questions and answers and chat because that gives me a good chunk of information right there at the beginning that I control that gives them something for replay value. Replay value is huge because the reason most live streams don't get good replay value is because of how you structure the live stream. It's not because live streams don't get shown. My live streams get just as much or more traffic as my regular videos do. But I, I'm actually getting more views and more watch time on my live streams on replay than I am during the live stream. And it's because of how I've structured the live streams. Yeah, we always have the, there's like certain points where it tends to stall out a little bit. You know what, one of the crazy ones where a lot of people stall out, and I did this for like a day, and I was like, please, somebody give me a subscriber. It was 666. And I've known like seven or eight or nine people that I know that got stalled at 666 on their subscriber count. I did for like a day. <clears throat> Mark of the Beast, 666. And then it took off. And then I went from 666. Once I started going again, all of a sudden, bam, I was at 700. It it, it goes in cycles. You're going to have waves of growth, and then it's going to stall. And it's going to wave of growth, and then it's going to stall. It's a lot. YouTube is a roller coaster. You don't want to jump off when you're at the top. Like I did four months ago or a year ago. You also don't want to stop when you're at the bottom. It's that roller coaster ride. You don't want to get off just because you're hitting a low. Just keep riding it. It's going to go back up. And the thing is, is that roller coaster ride should be kind of at an angle. So it's going to go down, but then it's going to go up higher. And it's going to go down a little bit, but then it's going to go up higher. So you're going to have ups and downs in your subscriber count. And again, you know, we talk about this all the time. A thousand subscribers. Once you get past that thousand subscribers, you shouldn't even consider subscriber numbers anymore. Subscriber count doesn't matter once you're monetized. The only reason subscriber count matters as a metric on YouTube is because YouTube says you have to have a thousand subscribers to unlock features in YouTube. If they were to change it, this is what D and Daniel were talking about this a few weeks ago. If YouTube, and I agree 100% with what they said, if YouTube were to change the metrics to a ratio of click-through rate, watch time, and viewer retention, and did a combination of that, it would benefit YouTube, and it would benefit the viewers. And take subscribers off the table as a metric for monetization and for unlocking features. They should make feature unlocks based on your click-through rate, your retention, and your total watch time. 
I've been on YouTube full time for a year yesterday. I've been on YouTube off and on for 10 years. I started my first YouTube channel in 2009. Um, if you watched the replay, if you weren't here at the beginning, I actually showed one of the videos from my first YouTube channel. It's a 12-year-old video. It has over 15,000 views. A lot of those views have been in the last two to three years. And, uh, you know, I was trying to say, YouTube is a long-term game. It's not a short-term game. It's not this month, next month, what's going on in the last few weeks. It's the fact that I have a video I did 12 years ago. I haven't even logged into that channel in over eight years. I don't even have the username and password to log into that YouTube account. <coughs> it was eight years ago. I don't remember what my username and password was eight years ago. I've moved a dozen times since then. I've gone through like seven computers since then. I have no idea what my username and password was eight years ago. I haven't logged into that account in over eight years, and I've still got over 15,000 views in the last eight years on that video. It's a long-term game. It was just one video. I only have like 45 videos on that channel. The majority of them have a few hundred views. There's a few of them don't even have a hundred views. That one, I have two view, two videos on that channel, and they're actually related. They're both on the same software. One got 15,000 views in the last six years, eight years, and the other one got 24,000 views in the last seven or eight years. And I know that they're more recent because I look at the comments. The comments were like six months ago, eight months ago, a year ago. So that video is still being served now, and it's 12 years old. It's outdated software that I was doing. It's a tutorial on a software that's outdated now anyway. But they're still showing that video because it's there. It's not that impressive, really. I know people getting that many views on a video in the first two weeks. But the fact is, with a channel with hardly any subscribers, I think I have like 80 subscribers on that channel. I haven't engaged in that community in over 10 years, and I'm still getting views on that content. The point with that is, if you're consistently adding content, that channel could have over a million subscribers right now. If I had consistently put content out, if I'd kept improving, if I had learned from what was working back then and kept doing more of the same and kept active on that community and engaged that community, those videos that have 15,000 subscribers, they could be 24, 50, 60,000 uh, video views on them instead of 15. All those other videos could be having hundreds or thousands of videos on them. That channel is an example of me being stupid enough not to take advantage of the situation that YouTube gave me. But at the time, I was just using YouTube as a free hosting platform. That was my very first YouTube channel. And my mindset back then was YouTube's a free place I can put videos and then put them into my website. Instead of thinking of YouTube as the second largest search engine in the world in a platform where I could actually build a community and then send them to my blog posts and my website, uh, I wasn't thinking that way. I was thinking I can, you know, host videos for free and plug them into my website. <clears throat> yeah, watch time is actually hard if you're not. This is where you have to lurk into your analytics. The reason watch time is hard is because people aren't looking and analyzing their content to see what they need to improve to keep people watching. Honestly, this is something a lot of people don't get. If you're having to beg your subscribers or beg people to watch your videos so that you get more watch time so you can get monetized, it's because you've done something wrong. You've got to go back and look at your analytics and say, where am I losing people? Why am I not getting watch time? Because I'll I tell you, I looked at this. I saw this just the other day. I showed it in my last live stream. I had a video that was getting great views, but I was losing 80% of my traffic in the first two minutes of the video. And one of the things I started doing was, okay, let's look at the keywords. Let's look at all the stuff. Let's look at all this stuff. I just did a video last week where I showed, I took videos that I went from a 80% drop off on several videos 
This is actually a different video is the one I used in that example, but it also had the same result. I lost 80% of my video of my traffic within the first two minutes of the video. I made three simple changes to my video and to my next videos. And those next videos, I went to, from an 80% loss to uh, 30, I, I gained 20%. And then by dropping my intro and changing my format of the introduction of my videos, I went to a 30% retention throughout my whole video. Or 40, I had one that was a 49.8% retention through my videos instead of 20%. So that's almost 30% difference just making a few tweaks. Hello, just me, Kathy. I hope you're having a great day. Thank you for joining us. So, yeah, always keep analyzing, learning, and growing. If you want to increase your watch time, look at the structure of your videos. And it's really easy because you can look at that audience retention report in your analytics. It'll show you where you're losing people. And you can actually look at the retention report with the video right there. And you can see exactly what's happening in the video where you lost people. And you say, okay, that's what I've got to change. This is where I'm losing people. That's what I've got to change. That's how I decided to drop the intros off my videos. Because I did that. I dropped the intros off my videos. My retention went up by 20%. I made a few other tweaks in how I did my hook and how I did my uh, introduction where I was introducing myself and I went up another 10%. So I went from a 80% loss to keeping 50% of my traffic. And once I got past that first two minutes, most of my traffic has stayed engaged in those videos throughout the entire video. There's a little bit of drop off, but nothing to concern about. And I'm still at like 30 to 40% retention by the end of the video. Yes, I will tell her happy birthday, Kathy. Thank you so much. I'm going to be wrapping up the live stream pretty soon, and I will be letting her know. So are there any other questions about how to grow your tube tube channel, how to uh, keep subscribers, whatever y'all have questions about with your YouTube journey, I am willing to answer um, any questions y'all have. Yeah, when I speed up, the analytics doesn't account for that. That that does affect your watch time. Um, but it, it's also, that when they're looking at watch time, you also have to realize they're looking at the time, but they're also looking at the percentage of the video. Not just, you know, they're not just looking at how long did it take them to get to the end of the video. They're looking at the percentage of the video actually viewed. I cut my intro after a few videos. Yeah. And see, that's what I did. I cut my intros out of my videos. I cut my intros here on this channel. I'm cutting down the intros on the storage cabinet. I still do my intros. I think people coming to live streams, one, usually I use my intro to kind of give people a chance to get in the room. So it's the first thing I do when I start my live streams is play my intro. Um, so for that, because I'm going live and I know I'm waiting for people to come in, get settled in, say hello, all that stuff. So I, I'm a little bit more lenient with the intros on the live stream, but for my videos, it's going to be shorter form content. I got to get in, I got to hook them and I got to get straight to the point. <coughs> so like one of the things that I talked about this in my last video, on my videos, one of the things I do now is come in hook why am i making this video this is what you're going to learn by coming into this video my name is james pruitt i help you build your channel create more engagement and optimize your channel for successful growth if you like that kind of content stick around we're going to show you how to do that then we jump right into the content notice i didn't tell them subscribe check out this leave a comment like i didn't do any of that i didn't give them a call to action yet i just told them who I am, what my channel is about. Now let's dive into the content. 
that quick. It should take less than 30 seconds to tell people who you are, what your channel's about. One sentence. You need to drill down your value proposition to one sentence that tells people what your channel is about. Introduce yourself, tell them who you are and what your channel is about. And then you dive straight into your content. If you start doing that, my retention went up 10% by doing that. Because that was one of the places I was losing people was whenever I was telling them to subscribe and hit the thumbs up and all that stuff. And was giving this long-winded explanation of my background taking me almost a minute and a half to get through that part of my video. I was losing about 10% of my traffic to that. When I dropped it and I started just bam, this is who I am value proposition. And then I asked for the subscribe later in the video. My subscriber rate also went up. So the amount of people actually subscribing after I've given them value versus the number of people that were subscribing when I dropped that, subscribe call to action at the very beginning of my video the subscriber rate versus views went up so now i'm getting a subscriber for every you know 75 to 100 views versus before it was like every two to 300 views i would get like one subscriber yeah the watch time but it's also the percentage of video viewed. That's the one that's actually the more important metric. And they might get, if they're doing it three-quarter speed, the time it took them to get to the end of the video might be shorter. But the percentage of the video they saw is still the same. I hope I'm explaining that correctly. I'm trying to explain that in a way that you understand. Thank you, Nady Pie. I'm trying to get there. It's got a, I got a long way to go. And I'm not worried about it. You know, one of the things a lot of people I see right now, you know, I've been on this channel for, what, month and a half? A little over a month and a half since I started this channel. And I know people that have been on this, on their channels about the same length of my time I am. They're freaking out because they don't have a thousand subscribers yet. They're freaking out because they don't have, you know, hundreds of views and hundreds of watch hours on their channel. I'm not worried about it. My number one focus right now is getting my channel to 50 videos. I'm not worried about views, watch time, subscribers. I look at those things. I'm paying attention to those things because it's giving me data to analyze what's working and what's not. So I know what to improve on my content. I'm looking at those things so that I know what I can do to better position myself within the community. But I'm not looking at that things and freaking out because I haven't reached these crazy goals yet. My number one goal on this channel is to get my content to 50 videos. This is number 24. Today's live stream will be number 24. So that's what you've got to look at. You've got to look at how much content are you putting out there. What are your controllables? Right now, I'm too small to be able to control how many subscribers I'm gaining. Right now, I'm too small to be able to control the level of influence I have over people's decisions on their YouTube channel. Right now, my focus is about creating a library of content on how to grow on YouTube. So I'm doing that every day. I'm working on working out another piece of content. I don't also, I'm not counting shorts in that sub, in that uh posting count. I'm not counting shorts. So I've done a few shorts on this channel, but I'm not counting those as far as my 50 views or 50 videos. Let me get half the watch time. Aww. There's very few people that do that. Most people hit that skip button. Skip the ads. Skip the ads. I let them play. I, I like to see people get paid. Um, so, um, you know, even if you're starting, you know, 
do what I've done. If you want to start, if you're just thinking about starting, the best way, you know, I was talking about the shorts earlier. And I know some people that have been here that have been talking to me for a while about starting a channel. They don't know where to start. You know, just get out there and start doing shorts. Do some short videos talking about what are the things that you're interested in? What are the things that you're passionate about? And one of the things that I use for picking out a niche is there's there's like three things. One is what pain have you been through? Maybe, I don't know, recently where you've been, you know, through something that was a painful experience that you could help other people with your experience. And you don't have to be an expert. You could just be somebody, I just recently went through this pain myself and this is what I went through. And this is what we're doing to deal with it. And this is how we're handling the stress that's come afterwards. And this is what we're going through now. And sharing that journey. Every video, every YouTube channel I've done, I've just been sharing my journey. That's why people come back to watch what I say. That's why people get invested in my content because I'm not trying to be an expert. I'm not trying to be a guru. I'm just here sharing my experiences, sharing my journey, sharing the pain I've been through and helping people resolve that pain by sharing what we did to overcome the pain, but also showing people ways to avoid the pain. Those are the kind of the two focuses that I have with every piece of content. So use your pain as a way to serve other people. And the other one is we all have hobbies. We all have interests. Hello, Ms. Eileen. Y'all, I've been talking about how I was a blogger 10 years ago and I was doing YouTube and stuff then. This lady is Ms. Eileen Smith from Basic Blog Tips. And she and I have known each other since I was a blogger 10 years ago. Beautiful lady. She's got some really great channel advice. So y'all pay attention to her. Um, but I was talking about, you know, how do you pick out your niche? One of the things that I use is pain. But the other thing is, what are the things that you're most passionate about? I can get up here on a live stream and talk to y'all about YouTube strategies all day long and feel like I've been here for 10 minutes. I can sit here all day talking about this stuff because I love it that much. I'm that passionate about it. I, I've been involved in it for over 10 years. I love it. I've learned a lot about what doesn't work from my own stupidity and my own mistakes. But I've also learned about a lot about what does work. And because of that, I think I bring some stuff to the table. But it's just sharing my journey and sharing my passion with people. I love this stuff. I love studying this stuff. I love digging into analytics. I love looking at how the algorithm works. I love looking at what's the little tweaks that YouTube's made. They got a new feature over here. Let's go play with it and see what it does. I love doing that stuff. Some people don't. They'd rather somebody else test it out and tell them how it works. And I'm good with that. I, I'm okay with that. You know, um, so that's why I do YouTube stuff. That's why I also do the mindset stuff. I do the mindset stuff because I'm passionate about that stuff. I've been studying that stuff for over 30 years. I started when I was in high school. And it's something that I, I really, really enjoy. And again, I can get into those conversations with people and I lose myself. What conversations do you have with people? What topics do you talk about that you completely and totally lose track of time that you know so much about? You could sit there and talk about it for hours and hours and hours and you don't realize the time just flew by. That's ideas. If you can sit here and talk, if you think about it, look at the average videos that we have on our channel, five to 10 minutes. If you can talk for three hours about a subject that you're really passionate about, you could build an entire YouTube channel on that topic. If you realize too, look at what a lot of the bigger channels do. As you're starting to look at, oh, I don't have any ideas for content. Look at what a lot of the big channels do. And we can look in this, this community, Nee Nimmin does it, Nick Nimmin does it, Brian G. Johnson does it, Daniel Batal does it. Look outside of this community. 
celebrity groups like Dave Ramsey. I love Dave Ramsey's stuff. I've been following his stuff for a long time. He does what I'm fixing to talk about all the freaking time. You can watch probably 10% of their content and know 90% of what they teach because they're repeating the same things over and over and over and over because they're still answering those same core questions with almost every piece of content. They say it in a little bit different way. They look at it from a little bit different angle. They might look at it from the top instead of the bottom or the side, but they're always repeating content. And that's one of the keys to success on YouTube that you got to realize if you start doing videos, say you do a hundred videos and then you go back to the beginning and you just remake those hundred videos. One, you've become better as a creator. You've learned more in depth yourself. And so you're able to take it a little bit further, take it a little bit deeper, take it a little bit different angle on it. Maybe there's been a change in things. And then also staying on top of your industry news. You know, a big one lately, TubeBuddy just got bought out by BEN Entertainment. So that's huge news in this industry. Um, if you're promoting TubeBuddy, if you've been involved with TubeBuddy, then that's a big news. Um, you know, so staying on top of the trends in your industry. Uh, there's a lot of you in the reselling community. I talked about this in last live stream. I still want to know, those of you that are eBay resellers, how many of you did videos on your channel about managed payments when managed payments came out last year? And the question I've asked people is if you didn't do a video on managed payments last year when managed payments came out, why not? That's a huge trend in your niche. And right now it's still going. There's still people that are struggling with that transition. So it's still a great topic, but it was super huge trend when it first came out last year. Whether you were for it or against it didn't matter. Just do content on that topic because that's going to take advantage of the trends going on in your niche. So, you know, just getting out there consistently trying to find out new ways, new ideas of content to put out there so you can touch more people and you can help more people's lives. Yeah. It's just why, you know, we talk about Google trends. People talk about going to Google trends or going to YouTube trending page to find trends, find the trends in your niche, find the trends. What are, what's the big changes going on in your community that would affect the viewers? Again, it's about understanding your audience, understanding what's important to your audience. And you're going to find changes that are going on. You know, if you're a reseller, okay, do People that are reselling are always wanting to know which is a better platform to sell on. One of the best types of videos to do versus videos. So you do Poshmark versus Macari, eBay versus Poshmark, eBay versus Macari, eBay versus Etsy. Which one is the better platform and why? And then you're just sharing your opinion on which will share Share some of the facts about each one and then share your opinion on which one is better. There's a video for a reseller. You're a dumpster diver? Which one is better finds? Walgreens versus CVS. Which dumpsters give you the better find? There's a versus video right there. Versus videos seem to do really really well with youtube and with viewers when you're doing that 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 battle kind of video you can do that with products if you're in affiliate marketing this is a great way you take two products that are similar which one's better you know which one's better for live streaming my boya bym1 lavalier microphone or my audio technica atr2100 which one is better for life? So the lavalier versus the stand mic. Which one is better? There's a versus video. I could do that video on this channel. Versus videos do really, really well. I did a video. It's one of the more popular videos on the storage scavenger I did a few months ago that was um, storage unit buying versus thrift shopping. 
and I talked about the pros and cons of storage unit buying, and I talked about the the pros and cons of thrifting for resale. And then I said, well, of course, you know, I'm the storage scavenger, so which one do you think I'm going to pick? But I pick storage units because I think it's a better bang for your buck. And I explained why. If I can pay, you know, my last storage unit, I paid 60 bucks for. I spent 60 bucks the last time I went thrifting and I got like one tenth of the stuff. Yeah. But see, she could do a video where she's showing what she got at Walgreens, what she got at thrift, and then comparing the hauls. Hey, you know what? This one, I got more candy. This one, I got more resellable stuff that I can list on eBay. This one, I got more stuff to stuff in the pantry. So, yeah, you can do a versus video, but you need to title it as a versus video. Instead of just, you know, saying we do this, actually break down that comparison and title it as a versus video. It's good. Those kind of videos drive. You're doing, you're crushing it anyway, Kathy. I'm, I'm not trying to give you advice on how to improve your dust to die video. I'm just saying that's an option for those that are doing this kind of stuff. You know, these are some ways to do that kind of content on your channel. I just using you as an example, but you're crushing YouTube anyway. You've been on for less time than I have. You've already got over 20,000 subscribers. You don't need me to tell you how to do YouTube. You, you got it. You're doing awesome. Food for thought. It's some ideas for your channel, but I mean, you know, and I understand the people that are always, that's one of the things that I found the people that are really successful are always trying to up their game. So, you know, you're crushing it, but you can continue learning. There are some little tweaks and things you can do to improve your channel. I would love to see you, Kathy, utilize your community tab more. I did a review of your channel the other day. I would love to see you do your community tab more and do more engagement through your community tab. I think you could actually really build up some engagement with your audience that way. Y'all, birthday girl's here. She's just hiding. See, there's seven people. I told you 11 o'clock's a good time. Different community, different niche. And seven is... Yeah, but that's that's a discussion we'll do later. Ah. Hi, guys. I delete them. You shouldn't delete them. That community tab is really really good for building engagement not just one time but over time and you can do polls over there hey what we, what kind of content would you rather see or you know what are Irene. we gonna find in this She's one on your facebook hi eileen 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 sorry uh i met eileen sorry yes you're on james happy facebook. birthday jessica thank you Oh, dumpster diving videos. What about this? Dumpster diving, diving video? videos are big on YouTube. Yes, they are. There's a whole community around dumpster diving. Nady Pie. Thank you. I like your name too. Ma and Tina and Jess and Tim. Thank you guys. I got, look, this is one of my birthday presents from uh, somebody else. <laughs> That wasn't that, me. That was not my husband. I got a whole bunch of jewelry and some clothes for my birthday. Yeah, if y'all didn't go to my storage scavenger channel yesterday, uh, last night's live stream, I gave her her birthday present during the you live did. stream. You want, hold on. Let me go show it to you. They haven't seen I was going to tell them to go watch the live stream so that they oh, can catch okay, the replay and mind. watch it. Can, <laughs> never mind. He told me to go. Y'all <laughs> but I will give you a hint. It made me feel like this. Wonder Woman. Okay, I'm gonna leave you. I'm gonna let y'all go. Y'all have a good day. Yeah, I'm actually. What? Is it? What you going to? Your oh, cause it's not showing up. Your live stream. Mm-hmm. Oh, he disappeared. No live stream. Well, sir, I have to go backwards because it still hasn't finished processing the video yet. 
And look, you just left your public just like that. They're right there. <laughs> oh, look, there's joined Jessica and James. Thank you. I liked it too. Yep. Kathy. There's our video last night from the live stream. We gave Jessica her birthday present. Y'all can check it out. I got it from Chris the Goose at an auction and she loved it. I did. I loved it. I'm just not wearing it right now because I, I think was... she's talking about this one. Oh, this one? Or that one. She was at the live stream. She hired Tim were at the live stream last night too. So anyway, I appreciate everybody coming in and hanging out. It's been two and a half hours almost since we started this live stream. I am going to, you know, respect y'all's time as well as my own. I have some other things I have to get done. Like I said earlier, I could sit here all day and talk about this stuff. But it's uh, my birthday. But it is her birthday, and I have other work that has to get done, and we got to pick up I, Jesse. Before I let you go, I should tell you that I got a bunch more jewelry than this, and I already told the person who gave it to me that James isn't allowed to sell it <laughs> because it's so nice. He probably tried to sell it off. <laughs> I'm not trying to sell your jewelry. You got a whole bunch of jewelry in the bedroom that I haven't tried to sell. I know, but I was just messing around. All right. So <laughs> right, thank you guys so much for joining us today. I hope y'all have a wonderful day. We will see y'all next time. If you have any questions, if you're watching this on the replay and I didn't answer your question, feel free to leave me a comment below and we will try to answer your questions after the replay. So y'all have a great day. We'll see you next time here at my video channel.